And let's pray to God as we come to his word. Lord Jesus, we have been singing and praying through this Palm Sunday hymn, Ride on, ride on in majesty, that your fiercest strife was nigh. We pray that we may behold your loving sacrifice and marvel at the wonders of your grace. Amen. Would you turn with me back to Matthew 27? To uh, the passage that Ruth kindly read for us earlier. So it's on page um, 834 it begins in the Bibles, in the pews. And as you know, we're, right, we're going, going through Matthew in a series, so this is the passage we've come to um, to do with the crucifixion. The film uh, Darkest Hour is about the challenging moment when Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of this country in 1940, early in the Second World War, when it looked as if Britain would lose the war and would be conquered by Nazi Germany. And the title is based on a part of a speech that he gave early in his premiership. And in some ways, this scene which we have before us is a similar moment, but it's much more serious even than that moment. In fact, it's the most momentous point in human history at which the future of the human race hung in the balance. If God were defeated by the devil, if Jesus were killed, if God were to die on the cross, then mankind would have no hope. The future of the human race, perhaps of the whole universe, would be lost. All would be subject to sin and death and futility and destruction. That's what was at stake at the cross. How do we even begin to understand this. I'd like to look at the passage in three sections, three W's this morning. The wrath of God, which begins with a W before you question me on that. The way of salvation and witness and worship. And if you're of a certain age, you may find the fact finders useful for going through this, the passage and the sermon as we work through it together. So do get some. They're at the back, I think. First, the wrath of God. So looking at verses 45 to 50. Jesus was on the cross for three hours from the sixth hour, midday, until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., when he died suddenly. In those three hours, the day became totally dark, this darkness was not a solar eclipse. This event took place near the Passover, and the Passover is always at a full moon, and a solar eclipse can only occur at a new moon. I know you all know that, of course. But rather, it's a supernatural act of God, showing his judgment upon sin. It was a fulfillment of Amos chapter 8, verse 9, when God, in condemnation of the people's sin, said that he would make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight, turning your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentations. Light is joyful. In recent years, a, a, a condition has been diagnosed of seasonal affective disorder, where we don't get enough light, which is abbreviated to SAD. We get sad if we don't have enough light. Light is life, and that light is necessary for life. And light is God's blessing on the earth. Taking the light away is to deprive of life, to move from life to death, to remove God's blessing and replace it with his curse. 
And we should never underestimate the wrath of God and his total opposition to our sin and his condemnation of it. Our sin is why the cross is needed. And this darkness shows the horror of the cross. Jesus, the beloved Son, who is one with God the Father, is counted as accursed by God by being hanged on the cross and banished from God's presence, abandoned by God as he takes our sin upon himself, sacrificing himself so that by his death we might be forgiven. Jesus' death is not just a physical death, but a spiritual death. John Calvin, the great reformer, wrote this, If Christ had died only a bodily death, it would have been ineffectual. Unless his soul shared in the punishment, he would have been the redeemer of bodies alone. In consequence, he paid a greater and more extreme price in that he bore in his soul the tortures of condemned and ruined man. Jesus suffering his punishment unto death was not only real, but it was total, body and soul. And it was only Jesus who could have done this. Only the sinless Jesus, a person of infinite value, united to us in his humanity, but remaining fully God, only he was qualified to pay the price of our sin, to fulfill the covenant with God. The death of an ordinary sinful human being would have achieved nothing. But Jesus' death as the sinless Son of God was the full and final payment and satisfaction of the covenant with God and of the law of God. But this payment is not without a price. Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is an agonized expression of Jesus' real forsakenness. It's the only time that Jesus addresses God without using the word Father, reflecting the sudden loss of that closest of relationships, which we can hardly imagine, that depth and intimate and loving and all-embracing relationship that Jesus had with God is suddenly gone. God in that moment is no longer his Father. Jesus had to be cut off from the fellowship with the Father that had been his eternally because he was bearing the sins of his people and so enduring the wrath of God. As well as the searing physical pain of crucifixion, Jesus suffers the immense spiritual agony of abandonment as the Father turns away from him. It's a mistake to think that Jesus was passive on the cross. Jesus did not suffer and die passively on the cross as one helplessly submitting to the inevitable. On the cross, he is actively engaged in the most colossal struggle that the universe has ever known. He has to uphold the moral pillars of the universe by rendering full satisfaction to divine justice. As our substitute and in our stead, he stood before the awesome tribunal of God, before the judge who abhors sin and burns against it with inexpressible indignation. Justice severe and inexorable was meted out on Jesus. As he endured the loss of his spiritual relationship with the Father, he descended into hell, into total separation from God in the darkness. Not that he was in any way guilty at all, but he took on himself all of our guilt, all of our sin. And all of this was completed on the cross. Also for the first time, quite alone without God, he wrestled in this darkest hour with all the power of the devil. He knew that if he could win this last battle, if he could lure Jesus away from God and tempt Jesus to doubt the love and grace of God, if he could overcome and destroy the Son of God, then all the universe would be his forever. This was the last and most terrifying attack of the devil, to undo not just Jesus' life work, but to undo God's rule of the universe. 
and to grasp everything for himself. But even in this darkest hour, even in the midst of this extreme conflict, even in his abandonment, Jesus does not reject God. In this terrifying battle, he actively resists the temptation to doubt God or to hate those who were crucifying him. Even in, even in these words of apparent despair, taken from Psalm 22, why have you forsaken me? Jesus affirms his relationship with God and his confidence in the Father's will. For Psalm 22, if you look at it later, ends in the expectation of God's triumphant intervention. From his use of those words, we see that Jesus knows why he is forsaken and that by his battle on the cross and by his death, he will achieve what he came to do to deliver God's great plan of salvation. Whatever the cost to himself, Jesus dies in victory, knowing that by his death all God's people will be set free from sin and death, that on the basis of his death and sinless life, he will present to the Father all of his own, united to him in his righteousness. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Jesus knew that by his death he would fulfill all the requirements of God's covenant. He could certainly have come down from the cross at any time, but he proved that he was the Christ by remaining on the cross and fulfilling all the covenant requirements of God and all his promises to redeem his people. Paul wrote again in Colossians chapter 2 that those who are dead in their trespasses, God made alive with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Our freedom from the tyranny of sin and the gift of eternal life in union with Christ are won by Jesus on the cross and are given to us by God's grace as a gift. It is through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that God fulfilled his covenant promises and achieved the salvation of his people. Jesus cried to God in Aramaic, Eli, Eli. It sounded similar to the Hebrew name for Elijah, Eliyahu. And some of the bystanders mistook his words as an appeal to Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet, who had been expected to return at the coming of the Messiah. But John the Baptist had already fulfilled the function of announcing Jesus as the Holy One of God, bringing in the new age of the fulfillment of God's salvation. So that's a red herring we need to set aside. The act of kindness in verse 48 of providing some sour wine, which is a cheap street drink, gave Jesus the physical strength to utter his final cry. It's not just that Jesus kept authoritative control over his destiny and the timing of his death as he yielded up his spirit, but his death is the greatest victory in the history of the universe. So his final cry is a shout of victory. It is finished, as we read in the other Gospels. The victory is won. The price of sin is paid. And the judgment of God is satisfied once and for all. The devil is cast out forever. But this great victory has been achieved at a terrible cost. Jesus is dead. His body is taken down from the cross and laid in a tomb. The second section to look at the way of salvation, verses 51 to 53. Matthew describes a series of events that powerfully demonstrate the impact of Jesus' death and vindicate his life-saving work on the cross. The first thing that happens is that God, at the point of Jesus' death, tears in two the huge curtain that enclosed the most holy place in the temple and that kept people from God's presence. It was torn from top 
to bottom. The barrier between God and man was completely removed. From the moment of Jesus' death, there is a new way of salvation. The only way to God now is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read, We enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened to us through the curtain, that is, through his death. That is, through his flesh. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. One of the signs in John's Gospel was the sign of the temple. When in John chapter 2, Jesus said that if the temple were destroyed, he would rebuild it in three days, showing that he himself was from now on the new temple, the only way to God, the only presence of God among his people. The unique sacrifice of Jesus now makes the temple system, the temple sacrifice system, obsolete. It is significant that Jesus died at the time of the daily sacrifice in the temple. As the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice, Jesus had fulfilled all the requirements of God's law once and for all. And in his death, he consummated and superseded all the temple sacrifices under the Old Testament system. Now that he has fully paid the price of our sin, God sweeps away the old system of temple sacrifices and eventually the temple itself. Salvation is now only by faith in Jesus Christ. And he is not just the means of God's salvation, but he is God's salvation in his own person. We now come to Christ. We don't come to a place or a building or a process or a system of knowledge or a mechanism. We come to a human and divine person who in his death has paid the price of our sin. We come to Jesus, believing in him and trusting in him. He himself is our salvation. He is the one who has saved us, who loves us, who cares for us, who calls us, and who will bring us to himself at last. And from now on, God's salvation is for all nations. In Isaiah 49, God said to his servant, which is a prefiguring of Jesus, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Jesus is the seed of God's covenant, foretold to Adam and Eve, promised to Abraham and to David, the one in whom God's salvation is fulfilled at the cross for all who are called to faith in him alone and so into a relationship with God. The momentousness of Jesus' death is also shown in the earthquake that split the rocks in the local terrain and opened the tombs of the saints, faithful people who had died looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. On the third day, when Jesus is raised as a testimony to the power of Jesus' resurrection, these old saints in tombs that the earthquake had broken open were also raised with him and seen briefly by many people in Jerusalem. They were not merely brought back to mortal life like Lazarus, but they were raised with new resurrection bodies as a foretaste of the resurrection of all believers at Christ's second coming. This is a witness to the new order of things that was beginning with the death and resurrection of Christ. It shows that the resurrection of all God's people derives from and depends on Christ's resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is described as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, his resurrection being the beginning of the resurrection of all those who have faith in him. This is a sign that all the people of God, the faithful saints of the Old Testament, and the faithful believers of the New Testament, who all look to Christ, united together in fellowship and in union with him, will all enjoy together the resurrection that Jesus' resurrection has begun. The third section, witness and worship, verses 54 to 61. What response would we expect to Jesus' crucifixion from those who were present? The centurion and the guards 
we're used to seeing men die in battle and by crucifixion. But these cataclysmic events, the darkness and the earthquake, coupled with the extraordinary self-control, purity and love shown by Jesus in his death, made the centurion and those with him realize that Jesus was the Son of God. This group of Gentile soldiers stands in contrast to the groups of Jewish people whom we heard last week mocked and reviled Jesus earlier in the chapter. And it points us forward to the disciples of all nations who will be reached by the gospel and who will replace the unbelieving Israelites in God's chosen people. The soldiers, we read, were filled with awe. And that is the proper reaction to the manifestation of God's power. Their confession echoes that of the 12 disciples in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm in Matthew 14, in response to which the disciples worshipped him and said to him, truly you are the Son of God. In the midst of all the religious leaders and all the pomp and show of the people of Israel at this festival, it's actually these Gentile soldiers who have got it right. Their confession, which in a way is their worship, is the proper response to the cross. And in contrast to those who reviled Jesus earlier in the chapter, who used the title Son of God as a form of abuse and mockery, these hard-bitten Gentile Roman soldiers restore the title Son of God to its proper use in reverence and awe. Matthew also records the names of some of the women who watched the crucifixion, who had accompanied Jesus as his disciples and would be the first witnesses of his resurrection. This in part is to establish the validity of their witness, the two Marys and Salome, the mother of James and John, two of the twelve disciples. Matthew wants us to know that there is no mistake about what has happened here. And these eyewitnesses are named to establish the truth of these events. He also recounts the burial of Jesus' body by Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, a man who did not consent to the council's actions against Jesus. We can assume that his high standing in society gave him access to Pilate, and he was able to approach him to ask for the body of Jesus. His action is courageous, as in seeking to bury Jesus, he risked the scorn of Pilate on the one hand and the wrath of his fellow members of the Sanhedrin on the other hand. Jewish law required that the crucified bodies be taken down before evening, especially before a Sabbath, which began at sundown on Friday. Jesus' body was laid in a new tomb which Joseph had been keeping for himself and his family. It would have been a rectangular chamber cut into rock, accessed through a low entry room, and blocked with a stone that could be rolled across the entrance to protect the body from wild animals and from thieves. This was much more expensive than a grave dug in the ground. Joseph now gave it as a permanent resting place for Jesus' body. This fulfilled Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9. They made his grave with a rich man in his death. Jesus' body was not just thrown with the other criminals' bodies into a common pit or a mass grave, as was common after a crucifixion. Some of this lays the foundation for the witness evidence for the resurrection. First, the location of the tomb and Jesus' body was known. His body was not just dumped into a mass grave, so the authorities could not claim later that it was lost. So any theories of Jesus' body being lost or that the women went to the wrong tomb are invalidated. The women had been to the tomb and they clearly knew exactly where it was. Second, the Roman authorities made sure that Jesus was dead. They had conducted many, many crucifixions, 
a common form of execution at that time, and they knew when someone was dead. Pilate, in agreeing to Joseph's request, would also have required that the body be kept secure. In addition, a guard of soldiers was set outside the tomb, as we will see the next time. Third, Matthew states that the two Marys, at least, saw the body of Jesus carried into the tomb and the stone rolled over the entrance to seal it. Again, this establishes their testimony that Jesus was dead and buried. Joseph wrapped the corpse in a clean linen shroud and placed it in his unused tomb. The burial had to be done in a hurry before sundown to comply with the law, so not everything was finished, and the women would have to return after the Sabbath when their witness and worship would be fulfilled. What they do here is a most tender act of worship. The care and the cost of the tomb and the expensive spices they used for burial, showing the great love they all had for their savior, their teacher, and their friend. What is all of this to us today? We know that Jesus is our covenant savior, God himself, who on the cross and in his resurrection achieved the redemption of all of God's people and fulfilled all of God's covenant requirements and promises, opening the new way of salvation to all who have faith in him. But the scale of his love is astonishing, isn't it? It's astounding. He had taught his disciples in Matthew 22 the summary of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The theologian Gerhardus Voss wrote of the cross, it might almost seem as if there were a reversal of the process of religion itself. Inasmuch as God appears to be putting himself at the service of man, and that with the absolute generosity born of supreme love. How will we respond to the supreme love of Jesus shown to us on the cross? Jesus told us that we must take up our own cross. Our cross is death to ourselves, denial of the right to go our own way, and submitting to God's direction of our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote, For the love of Christ controls us, because we, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. How should we live as those who live no longer for themselves, but for the Lord Jesus Christ? In our words, we must speak our testimony as the centurion did, saying truly this was the Son of God. In our actions, we must love as Joseph and the women disciples did in burying Jesus with such devotion and generosity. In our lives, we must live joyfully because the new way of salvation through faith in Christ is open to us at the cross, knowing that we too will be raised with all his saints, old and new, when he returns to call us home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we stand before the cross, we are humbled and in awe. The absolute generosity of your supreme love for us through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is overwhelming. We pray that you would enable us to live our lives no longer for ourselves, but for him, for Jesus. To speak out in witness to your love and grace shown to us in him, to show your love in our actions and relationships with all those around us, and to live joyfully knowing that you have saved us by the work of Jesus on the cross.
and that you will raise us with all your saints when he returns in glory. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.